Hi, I'm Patrick Braga. I'm a third year dual degree student in urban planning and music. And uh, I'm a Rawlings Presidential Research Scholar. And my research project is outlining the ideological and legislative shifts that enabled dramatic changes in the urban landscape in Rio de Janeiro. So at the turn of the 20th century, Rio de Janeiro had a decidedly neoclassical downtown. But today, a century later, many of the city's most iconic buildings and landscapes have absolutely disappeared. So let's begin where street ends. So terminating the vista of Rio Branco Avenue, uh, the major financial thoroughfare of downtown Rio, is Oscar Niemeyer's uh, monument to, National Monument to the Dead of World War II, whose alignment is just offset from the famed Sugarloaf Promontory in the distance. To reach the monument, a visitor leaves the historic downtown fabric marked by an obelisk celebrating the inauguration of Central Avenue, a boulevard that later became the Rio Branco. Though the obelisk once leaned against the waters of Gloria Bay, it now fronts the eight-lane parkway defining the Flamengo Park, the largest park in the city. And the design from above still follows the axis of the Rio Branco, but it spares no mode of transportation the need to dislocate its path and deviate both to cross the, the highway and to approach the monument, which you can see on the dotted red lines there. And this, uh, th this design deviates from the dramatic phenomenological intent of going down the axis towards the monument. And in a way, it articulates an uneasy relationship between Brazilian modernism and the neoclassical past of Rio de Janeiro. Now, engineer and mayor Francisco Pereira Passos, who served from 1902 to 1906, had as his goal for the construction of this central avenue, uh, abolishing colonial urbanism and bringing public health to the city of Rio de Janeiro. And so the project demolished uh, tenement houses and sought to express Rio de Janeiro's increasing importance in the globe by importing European modules, models of grandeur. And the Rio elite pursued aesthetics as as much an amenity um, as important to other recreational uh, niceties such as parks and inter entertainment venues in an attempt to make Rio de Janeiro resemble a great European capital uh, in South America, of course. Now, in 1912, the Avenida Central was renamed the Avenida Rio Branco after an important diplomat. And in two decades, the avenue exp experienced a shift in land use from nightlife entertainment to office buildings. And today, one can literally count on both hands the number of original buildings that have not been demolished to make way for international-style skyscrapers. Now, the attachment of the notion of civilization to political reform during the transition out of the Brazilian monarchy into the republic foreshadows the government's later attachment to modernism, be it through the populist dictatorship of Getulio Vargas, who my grandparents absolutely love. Uh, and uh, he had this idea of another grand history erasing boulevard through the city. And he also uh, was, a, it was around the same time as the Capanema Palace was built, which was the first high rise in the world to have a completely glass exterior or during the, the military dictatorship when the high-end neighborhood of Baja da Tijuca was designed in imitation of some principles of Brasilia. And today, you also see it in government-sponsored designs, for instance, with the National Development Bank annexed in downtown Rio, or the Museum of Image and Sound in Copacabana Beach. Unlike the United States, it seems that at no moment did any Brazilian government, starting with Vargas, support revivalist or traditional styles that tried to hearken the past. But how did the Central Avenue project begin to express more contemporary notions of modernity? Well, for one, it was fundamentally distinct from other international attempts at creating Parisian-style boulevards because of its reliance on the, on the so-called eclectic style, which had its foundation an era of individualism, where each building would be unique and be able to reinterpret historical styles freely and create something that was simultaneously old but also new and modern. This is distinct from urbanism in Brasilia or in Paris, both cities, even though Brasilia is hypermodern and Paris is in a sense hyperclassical, uh, they both have a relatively sterile normalcy on buildings that lead up to monuments. And this articulates and differentiates the private economic realm and the public realm to produce a defined civic space. Not so in the Avenida Central project. This is the now demolished Monroe Palace, which over the course of its 71 year history served as the Brazilian pavilion in the 1904 St. Louis Exposition in Missouri, uh, exposition in St. Louis, Missouri, then reconstructed in Rio de Janeiro as the Brazilian House of Representatives, the Brazilian Senate, and then as a government office building until August 1975. And on that month, the very last uh, office workers left the building, and a leading newspaper put forth two points of view on the building. 
The Engineering Club declared the building a mark of universal architecture beyond national significance, but at the same time, the director of the country's uh, chief historic preservation body called the building stylistically insignificant, which I personally disagree with. But the shift to Brazilian modernism then, after World War II, isn't quite as smooth and universal a transition as historical narratives tend to set it, even as late in the 1970s as these discourses illustrate. And another inkling of an appreciation for neoclassicism appre appears just a year earlier in the same newspaper, where the French uh, neoclassical revival style palace where the Rio de Janeiro state governor lives uh, was said to reflect the refined taste of its original builders. And indeed, it suggests a more delicate cultural interaction between the new and the old, because the modernist apartment houses around it were designed by Lucio Costa, an, urban, an important urban planner who we'll encounter in two slides. So this isn't to say that the relationship between modernism and classicism was completely smooth, because a May 1975 article in the same newspaper denounced the Monroe Palace as an architectural monster, and actually uses the excuse of opening up the view that I showed you earlier from the obelisk towards the World War II monument, which illustrates a shift from the classicist enclosure of urban space uh, into the modernist uh, appreciation of sweeping open views. But to problematize the Brazilian preservation of this discourse once more, the same article in the 1970s speaks highly of colonial architecture while decrying late neoclassical and eclectic architecture. So this is the uh, 1922 Ministry of uh, Agriculture, which was left over from the uh, World Expo of the same year. And even though there's a greater degree of stylistic continuity from Portuguese Brazilian Baroque to this late neoclassical style, uh, an author decried it blocking the view of two colonial period buildings. But when the Central Avenue was being built in the early 1900s, it was buildings like these that were hailed as striking modern edifices, whereas the old colonial Baroque that now is being hailed in the 1970s was being pictured as old and shoddy. And so the, eventually the Ministry of Agriculture building was also demolished in the 1970s, much, much like what happened to, uh, with the Monroe Palace, in its place came another unusable lawn of grass surrounded by fences where insensitive landscaping and bad tree placement does little to accentuate the rich details of colonial ornamentation on the adjacent buildings that it was meant to glorify. Now let's take a look at Lucio Costa, one of the people behind this mid-century appreciation of colonial architecture and distrust of the neoclassical neo style. Now, early in his career, Lucio Costa, before he designed the modernist, automobile-oriented design of Brasilia, the, new, the country's new capital, he was designing buildings in an impressive mastery of Iberian colonial style. And precisely because he and Oscar Niemeyer are among the founding fathers of Brazilian modernism, it came to me as a shock when I found this quote of his, and this is my translation. French styles are absolutely dissonant in Rio, given the climate, colors, and landscapes, and ought to be banished outright. But frankly, modern styles, even when adapted with moderation, are risky. They may be the taste of the times, a question of fashion, and tomorrow seem ridiculous, extravagant, intolerable. And so it seemed to me little prudent to apply the style to any construction of permanent character, this being the reason why I made the upstream journey to our, the explorers of the 16th century and searched in the old Iberian Peninsula, our common crib, the essential elements of style. But unfortunately, this appreciation came at a rather weird price because while Costa when, when Costa served as the head of uh, historical preservation in Brazil, he approved several ill-placed and contextually insensitive high-rises, this being one among many in the city. Uh, but returning to the Monroe Palace, perhaps the most unfortunate aspect of its demolition was the monument's long-standing importance as a mediating element between urban space and waterfront. And perhaps the most impressive representational aspect of the building was this, precisely because it switched so many different political hands from a brand new republic through a mili military dictatorship and almost into the return of democracy in the 1980s. And its demolition, in a sense, represents also the misguided sense of urban design with no sense of a normative end goal. But of course, there's a political side as well, because I, I posit that perhaps the military regime in favoring modernity and Baroque imperialism saw in those styles perhaps a truly Brazilian authorita authoritarianism represented in architecture. And so to start wrapping up, now that we're aware of the importance of preserving the past built environment and the stories it tells, what do we do with buildings like this? Uh, this one was designed by Oscar Niemeyer, probably the f most famous Brazilian architect and the most important too. But practically none of his buildings in Rio de Janeiro, all of which were preserved in 1998, have a good interface as set by uh, contemporary best practices. And this monstrous building begs the question of whether all his works ought to be preserved. But at the same time, 
Framing a question like that put us, puts us exactly in the same shoes as the very myopic decision makers uh, who didn't appreciate architecture of their recent past. But after all, the man was important in Brazilian architectural identity and cultural history, but it's hard to deny that many of his works were extraordinarily anti-urban, and in the case of this recent posthumous office tower, maybe there was a reason it wasn't built during his lifetime, disastrously out of scale with his surroundings. And you can walk around this neighborhood on Google Street View, and it's just there towering over these short historic buildings. At the same time, however, there have been precedents in the city um, for adapting significant Nehemiah buildings to make them more urban friendly. We just have to hurry before more of these historically sensitive structures are demolished and replaced with blank walls and opaque surfaces. So we return where we began, the empty lawn of grass downtown where uh, both the obelisk and the absence of the Monroe Palace rep represent the demolition happy history of Rio de Janeiro. May these serve as reminders that context is important, history is important, and any new plan for the city can only make Rio de Janeiro a more livable place if the city can respond to and learn from its own stories. Thank you.